the brightness of this day has given me the golden opportunity to pen you this my missive. And then after writing one chapter, he would then intervene before I commence. He has commenced already. But you say before I commence, I want to know your present condition of health. So before I proceed further, permit me to also acknowledge my colleagues who are here, uh, Dr. Bafo, Safu J, uh, the Honorable Victor Usu, Kwekudia, um, Dr. Professor um, Ekuoku, and the rest of them. And I thought I, I saw my colleague, the Honorable Patricia PJ here. I don't know whether it was a ghost that I saw. Professor Chairman, as an alumnus, I have been proudly following the achievements of my alma mater, in particular the recent laurels won by the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in the ranking of universities worldwide. Best University in Ghana and West Africa for three years running. The 12 best in Africa, according to the US News and World Report. Mr. Chairman, I'm wondering if anybody can tell me how Nathan Rant really, and I know my colleagues, some of them who are here, they were there. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has been ranked in May 2022 as quote, the top university in Africa, and 14th globally, with a score of 83.7% based on its commitment to Sustainable Development Goal 4, SDG 4, Quality Education. <laughs> I kindly accept my sincerest congratulations, and I urge you to continue the good work for God and country. My gratitude and admiration go to the hard-working public lecture committee. Your intuition and sensitivity in the choice of a subject matter, which is a permanent issue now, is remarkable. I just took a cursory look at the program and noticed that I've been allotted 40 short minutes. Professor Chairman, as I indicated to you, I don't want to believe that this is an examination paper. Notwithstanding, I shall endeavor to score all the goals by full time. However, I do know that Professor Chai would allow me injury time and extra time if needs be. I've been accused oftentimes of being quite loquacious by many, but it is an occupational hazard. I believe ordinarily I'm a man of few words, and I, I trust. Sincerely, that my wife will attest to that. As a Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, I have since 2017 flagged the need to revisit the 1992 Constitution. The 2022 Annual Action Plan of the Ministry encapsulates this activity as the Minister's priority area under the key issue, deepening democratic governance. This is because as a practicing parliamentarian of continuous 25 years experience, I believe I have sufficient acquaintance with the 1992 Republican Constitution and therefore properly primed to advocate for a review. I am accused by many that the Constitution is my second Bible. I always carry a hard copy. And why not? It is a living document and I must share my bed with it in order for the two of us to have an effective relationship. I can talk to it, and it can also talk to me. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, it has been three decades since the fourth Republican Constitution of Ghana was promulgated on the 28th of April, 1992. This Constitution has endured and served the nation generally well, having successfully underpinned the fourth Republic which is the longest democratic dispensation this country has enjoyed since independence. However, there have been numerous appeals for the Constitution to be revisited. Many well-meaning and prominent Ghanaians have made suggestions 
for the amendment of particular constitutional provisions and even a reconsideration of the suitability of our system of governance. Which frame of government, presidential, Westminster, or a hybrid, would facilitate optimum development for a small unitary country such as ours? Three of our past presidents, President J.J. Rawlings, President J.A. Kufo, and President J.E.A. Mills, have all at various times spoken about the need to amend aspects of the 1992 Constitution. The current president, Nana Dudanko Ekufuado, has also joined the fray of those who have been unambiguous and unequivocal in their advocacy for amendments to the Constitution. They cannot all be wrong. However, just like any other endeavor in life, there are some of our compatriots who are opposed to the idea of a review. Some notable Ghanaians, though in the minority, it seems to me, have expressed the desire to maintain the status quo. And they say to us that if it is not broken, why fix it? They hold a conservative view that the constitution is satisfactory in its current form. There are yet others who opine that the spirit of the law must guide the conduct of the polity. Ghanaians, rather, they argue, need an overhaul in their values. In other words, something more than a constitutional review, a complete transformation, or no blasphemy intended, a complete transmogrification, or to be relevant on the campus of the University of Science, a total transmutation of Ghanaians is required, something more than a constitutional review. It is the reason why it has been said in some quarters that the constitution has not failed, but rather as the people, we have failed. Now let me relate to the architecture of the constitution. My thoughts are simply that the preamble of the constitution establishes the mission of the republic when it registers boldly and I quote, in the name of the almighty God, we the people of Ghana have established a framework of government to secure for ourselves and posterity the blessings of liberty, equality, opportunity, and prosperity. This we have done on the platform of freedom, justice, probity, and accountability, and based on the principle of universal adult suffrage, the rule of law, the protection and presentation of fundamental human rights, and freedoms, unity, and stability of our nation. The sovereignty of the Ghanaian people and the supremacy of the 1992 Republican Constitution are established by Article 1, Clauses 1 and 2 of the Constitution. Article 3, especially Clause 4, commits the defense of the 1992 Constitution into the hands of all citizens of Ghana, and indeed, unless and until all the citizens of Ghana elect to abandon that responsibility, that right and duty at all times to defend the 1992 Constitution. The 1992 Constitution shall continue to exist and be operational. Articles three, 1 to 3 constitute Chapter 1 of the 1992 Constitution. Chapter 2 is on the territories or the areas that make up the geographical entity called Ghana. Chapter 3 defines who is a Ghanaian whereas chapter four covers what the laws of Ghana are. Chapter five, which comprises clauses, one, uh, clauses 12 to 33, is on fundamental human rights and freedoms and the protection of same rights and freedoms. Chapter six provides the mission statement of the state, captured as the directive principles of state policy. It is the policy encapsulation of the overall development plan for the country expressed as the political objectives, that is in Article 35, economic objectives, Article 36, social objectives, Article 37, educational objectives, 38, cultural objectives, Article 39, international relations objectives, Article 40, and duties of citizens, Article 41. The coalescence of these objectives should be the realization of basic human rights, a healthy economy, the right to work, the right to good health care, the right to education as expressed in Article 34 2. In the event an obligation is imposed 
by the Constitution on Parliament, the President, the Judiciary, the Council of State, the Cabinet, political parties, as well as other relevant bodies, to be guided by the directed principles of state policy in taking and implementing any policy decisions which will culminate in the establishment of a just, united, free, stable, and prosperous Ghanaian nation underpinned by a transparent and accountable government as contained in Article 34.1 of the Constitution and indeed the preamble of the Constitution. Democracy is a representative government and in recognition of that, citizens are accorded the right to vote, which right is secured via registration for the purposes of public elections and referenda. And that is provided under Article 42. It is therefore strange for some people to rise up, as occurred about four years ago in the lead up to the 2020 elections, to canvass the idea that every citizen of 18 years must be allowed to vote. Article 43 grants the right to Ghanaian citizens who are 18 years of age or above and of sound mind to vote. But that right can only be exercised after one has registered as a voter. So if you are 40 years of age and you are a Ghanaian and of sound mind, you cannot just simply walk to a polling station to cast your vote unless you have your name in the book of life, which is the voter's register. Now, I guess it's important to talk a bit about the role of political parties. Political parties are vehicles for shaping the political will of the people to disseminate information, which information itself must be well researched and appropriate, not propaganda, on political ideas, social and economic programs, and sponsor candidates for elections to any public office other than the district or lower local government units. And that is contained in Article 55. That's why the political parties themselves must get it right and themselves be populated by experienced, competent, efficient, and effective persons who can churn out ideas which have the potential of maximizing the rate of socio-economic development to secure maximum welfare, freedom, and happiness of every person in Ghana, and to provide adequate means of livelihood and sustainable employment to the Ghanaian people and public assistance to the needy as contained in Article 36 of the Constitution. Prof. Chairman, I guess it's important to also relate to the anchor of the Constitution. The anchor of the 1992 Constitution is provided by us, the preamble of the Constitution provides the framework of government which sustainably secures for the citizens of today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, the blessings of liberty, equality of, of opportunity, and prosperity. Now, the principal strands of the anchor are, one, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the council of state. Besides these, one can also identify other constitutional creatures, that is the independent governance institutions such as the Electoral Commission, the Media Commission, the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, the National Commission for Civic Education, the Public Services, the Armed Forces, the Police Service, the Fire Service, the Auditor General, the Government Association, and many others. Finally, one cannot be unmindful of the role defined for our chiefs under Chapter 22 of the Constitution. We have practiced the 1992 Constitution for close to 30 years now. Are the various strands in place effectively and efficiently functional and contributing to the smooth functioning of the greater whole? Or is it the case that some of the strands are loosening up or exfoliating or even peeling off? Do some of the strands need tightening up or repairing? or retrofitting. Professor Chairman, I'll start with the executive. The president that the Constitution has erected in Article 57 
is a head of state, the head of government, and commander-in-chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. The executive authority in Ghana vests in the president. That is captured in Article 58. And the executive authority of Ghana extends to the execution and maintenance of the constitution and all laws made under or continued in force by the 1992 Republican Constitution. Accordingly, all appointments into the public services are at the instance of the president. That is captured in Article 195. And I quote, the power to appoint persons to hold or to act in an office in the public services shall vest in the president. So all public servants exist at the instance of the president. And sequel to this provision, the president appoints the head of civil service, that is referenced Article 183. In the meantime, there is a, even a conflict between Article 1947 and 71.1d. The president appoints persons to the police council, Article 201G and H. He appoints the IGP, Article 202, Prison Service Council, Article 206, 1 and K, Director General of Prison Service, Article 207, Armed Forces Council, Article 211T, the CDS, and Service Chiefs, Article 212, Fire Service, Shrug, Article 217, Commissioners of NCC, Article 232, Media Commission, 166, Governance Association, 185, MMDC is 243. The governing boards of various bodies and authorities established by various acts of parliament, ambassadors, high commissioners, etc., etc. Indeed, any president appoints more than 5,000 officers into public office. We are still counting. This certainly, Professor Chairman, is a monarch that the Constitution has created. The rest of us citizens hold him in awe, and if and when he strays, it is difficult to talk straight to him. This arrangement needs to be revisited. It cannot be good for our growth. It cannot be good for the growth of democracy. The country needs a head of state and government. Therefore, agreeably, and understandably, at any given time, we shall have a president or a prime minister. However, there is an empirical study conducted by the World Bank which suggests that small unitary countries are better served with prime ministers as heads of state other than presidents. A president has the whole country as his constituency, whereas a prime minister operates from his, his or her own small self. When the parliamentary leader wins and his party wins majority of seats in parliament, he becomes the prime minister. His campaign purse is small as compared to the president's campaign wardrobe. Of late, electioneering campaign funds of contestants at every level of political arrangements has been escalating. The campaign funds of parliamentary candidates from primaries to national elections is averaging $600,000, $600,000. That is according to the research conducted by CDD in respect of the events culminating in the 2020 elections, $600,000. If we are com converting it to cities now, it will be 4.8 million Ghana cities to elect a member of parliament into office. Now, if you let such a person into office, he or she is not a father Christmas. You make him a minister. What do you think will happen? And as a nation, we turn around, we say we want to combat corruption. How do you combat corruption when we do this to ourselves? And as chairman, that amount is huge. We are here to begin counting the counting of notes in the lead up to the 2024 elections. The campaign pairs of a presidential candidate from party primaries to the national elections by any proper reckoning and accounting cannot be less than the equivalent of 50 million United States dollars. 
How much does that translate to? 50 million. Over 400 million. Where do the candidates have the money from? There is a nexus between huge campaign expenditure and corruption through the award of contracts. What therefore should be our preference, pursuant to good governors? As a nation, we must confront this. Do we need this expensive structure of government in the present, or a much lesser evil in the form of a prime minister who is, as well, much more accessible and accountable to the representatives of the people? We have a choice. In a strict presidential system, ministers are appointed from outside parliament. Invariably, they are all technical persons in various fields who, when they come to be appointed, are able to assist the president in the determination of policy of government and also for the efficient running of the state. These are experts, they are consultants, technical people, they are professionals who add value to government. That is what obtains in the United States of America, which is the flagship of presidential systems in the world. In the Westminster system, the prime minister appoints ministers for the same purpose in the determination of general policy of government as contained in our constitution, Article 76.2, and also for the efficient running of the state, Article 78.2. The ministers in the Westminster system are not necessarily technocrats, but they are often long-serving members of parliament who must have served on committees for some time, risen to chair the committees, or perhaps served as shadow ministers and acquainted themselves with all matters pertaining to particular ministries or departments or agencies, such that they might have become authorities in matters concerning the various ministries, departments, and agencies. When such people are appointed as ministers, there is manifest value addition, unlike what obtains in our fourth republic, where because of the hybrid system of government that is being operated, the president is compelled to appoint the majority of ministers from parliament, and that is according to Article 78.1, which provides ministers of state, and I'm quoting, shall be appointed by the president with the prior approval of parliament from among members of parliament or persons qualified to be elected as members of parliament, except that the majority of ministers of state shall be appointed from among members of parliament. You are all witnesses to what obtains in such an arrangement. Many ministers, deputy ministers, when they get nominated and who appear before the appointment committee of parliament, when asked fundamental questions rudimentary questions relating to their designated ministries would often respond, and I'm quoting them. I don't know, please. You approve of me, and when you do approve of me, when I go there, I shall learn. <laughs> what are you going to learn? When the Constitution provides that you shall assist the president in running the state efficiently, and the Constitution provides that you shall assist the president to evolve policies for your ministry. You are telling us at the appointment committee that we should approve of you. When you go there, you go and learn. So what value addition are they adding to your governance? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what you have. How are such persons, rudimental learners, going to assist the president in the determination of general policy? of the ministries, the superintendent, or indeed of the government. How are they going to help in the efficient running of the state? There's one principal reason why, as a nation, we are marking time. We are stuck, because many of our ministers do not add value to our governance. That's the truth. And I'm not here talking about the current MPP administration. I refer to all administrations since 1983. The time has come for us to seriously introspect on this. And hasn't the time come for us to place in the Constitution an upper ceiling on the number of ministers of state that we should have? As I've already stated, cabinet ministers assist the president in the evolution of policies. 
That is according to Article 76 of the Constitution. All bills and agreements that are presented to Parliament are underpinned by governmental policy and principles, which the cabinet ministers propose to cabinet. So if you are not a cabinet minister, you are not part of the process of the evolution of policy. That means that a member, a minister who is not a cabinet minister, cannot assent to or present a bill or agreement to parliament if that minister is not a cabinet minister. And therefore, is not part of the process of the formulation of policy and principle. If that is the case, as I believe it is, why have such huge number of ministers in the first place? Again, it's important for us to do serious introspection on this and interrogate the Constitution. The Constitution provides in Article 76 1 that there shall be a cabinet which shall consist of the president, the vice president, and not less than 10 and not more than 19 ministers of state. And quote, given the role of ministers of state, who cabinet ministers are, that is for running the state efficiently and assisting the president in the determination of policy of his government. It is my contention that apart from regional ministers, the number of central government ministers may not have to exceed 19, as contained in the Constitution. And that means ministries shall also not have to exceed 19. All ministers, to be relevant and to be able to assist in the evolution and determination of policy in their sectors, must be cabinet ministers. The excess numbers must be cut off, and that will significantly reduce public expenditure. For the avoidance of doubt, the Constitution must provide for that. Now, Article 68 provides, among other things, and I'm quoting, whenever the President is absent from Ghana or is for any other reason unable to perform the functions of his office, the Vice President shall perform the functions of the President until the President returns. That construct let me go over it again. It says, whenever the president is absent from Ghana or is for any other reason unable to perform the functions of his office, inherent in that construction is that when the president travels outside the country, he's unable to uh, perform his functions as a president. Is that the case? Does the mere absence of the president from Ghana mean inability to perform the functions of his office? This cannot be true in this technological age, or in situations where the president exits the jurisdiction in his capacity as president to perform official duties for the country. For instance, he attends meeting at the United Nations. When he goes, he's still the president. So why do we say that he's not able to perform his functions as a president? And for that matter, have the vice president sworn in, and the vice president is not there, to have the speaker of parliament sworn in as acting president. The man is there performing his duty as the President of the Republic. We need to amend this provision. Mr. Chairman, Article 78.1 provides for a President to appoint a Minister of State with a prior approval of Parliament. When a Minister of State is nominated by the President for a specific ministry, he is vetted for that ministry. If for any reason the president has to move that person to another sector, parliament must vet the person again for that new position in order to satisfy themselves that the person has some competence and knowledge for that new designation. Otherwise, there may not be any value addition in these reshuffles. You are nominated as Minister for Agriculture. You are so vetted as Minister of Agriculture. The next moment, you become you are shifted to maybe finance, and you don't come before Parliament again for vetting. How do we assess your competence in that area, in that new area? It would be better for us to assess the competence of any minister or deputy minister if that person is reshuffled in the court of Parliament via the appointment committee. We must all acknowledge that ministerial or deputy ministerial appointment is serious business and should not be reduced to try and error. Because government is about lives of people. In the United States of America, 
You are appointed to a ministry. They call them secretaries. If you perform, you are maintained. If you don't perform, you are taken out. You are not to be shuffled to another ministry. If you have to be reshuffled, you have to face the vetting committee of the Senate, of Congress. That's how it's done. Not so in our part of the world. And I'm saying that is not adding value to our government. Now, let me say a few words about the Attorney General. The Attorney General, who is a principal legal advisor to the government, is a minister of state appointed by an incumbent president. That is Article 88 of the Constitution. The Attorney General is responsible for the initiation and conduct of all prosecutions of criminal offenses, Article 883. All offenses prosecuted in the name of the Republic of Ghana shall be at the suit of the Attorney General or any person bearing the authority of the Attorney General. If the Attorney General is a minister in a ruling party's government, certainly human as he is, he would tend to treat his colleague ministers with kids' gloves and only go after opposition elements and former ministers. That's what we have. It is proper and prudent to insulate the Attorney General and assure his independence. For instance, the status of the Attorney General could be made equivalent to the Chief Justice, or at least a Justice of the, Superior, of the Supreme Court. He must not be a Minister of State appointed by a President. By that, he would traverse several administrations, his financial autonomy will be guaranteed, and then shall we witness the demonstrable prowess of an Attorney General. An amendment to Article 88 is required. The National Development Planning Commission. The National Development Planning Commission is a vital cog in the development agenda of this country. The broad architecture of national development is provided, as I've already indicated, by the directive principles of state policy, expressed in the broad ambit of political objectives, economic objectives, social objectives, education objectives, cultural objectives, and international relations objectives. The National Development Planning Commission is mandated to craft a long-term development plan for these development themes for the nation based upon which the various political parties are required to craft their manifestos, as required by Article 55.3 of the Constitution. When this has been achieved, then the relevance of Article 35.7, which provides, and I'm quoting Article 35.7, as far as practicable, a government shall continue and execute projects and programs commenced by the previous governments. The relevance of this then shall be established because the NDPC would have crafted a long-term development plan. The political parties would have crafted their manifestos, indeed woven their manifestos, around the long-term national development plan. And then the obligation imposed by Article 35.7 then would be relevant because we are singing the same tune. And so when this party, we may only differ in the details of application of the development plan. We shall have a common national development plan ourselves. Now this has become difficult to achieve because the political parties have no guide from the NDPC. On the part of the NDPC, it is not for want of trying. The truth of the matter is that the very composition of the NDPC as provided under Article 86 makes it politically tainted. If you look at Article 86, the vast majority of the membership of NDPC is ministers of state at any given time. So regardless of the quality of the product, if it is done by MPP, NDC doesn't want to have anything to do with it. If it's done by NDC, the MPP doesn't want to have anything to do with it. I believe that the provision on the NDPC, especially in respect of the composition, that is the ministers from one political party, Article 86 to, shall have to be amended to strengthen its role and serve as the principal driver of the national development plan, of the national development agenda with the long-term development plans that they shall craft. Now, let me say a few, a few words about electoral commission. This is a body that occupies a central role in the framework of government that we have established. Its commissions or omissions could either advance our democracy or draw back our democracy. 
it is the responsibility of the commission to, quote, demarcate the electoral boundaries for both national and local government elections. That is Article 45B. The commission is charged with the function to, I'm quoting again, to review the divisions of Ghana into constituencies at intervals of not less than seven years or within 12 months after the publication of the enumeration figures.